So we're going to begin with holding in Tehillim, Perik, Cafe, Chapter 25. This one is a little bit longer than the average Perik, so we're going to split it in two. Do the first portion tonight and the second portion after Chag HaShavuot. As you know, next week is the holiday. So we'll come back with Zadash in two weeks from now. This chapter may appear familiar to you because we say it almost every day in our prayers right after the Tfilat Amidat, after the Amidat prayer. It's part of the Tachanun. Le David alecha Adonai nafshi esa. So le David, Kama, David is the one that's composing this prayer. Elecha Hashem nafshi esa, he says, I raise to you my spirit. It's a very unusual type of statement to make. What does it mean, I raise to you my spirit? This is a description of one's readiness to give his life if necessary. As we call it in Hebrew, mesirut nefesh. There are times that a Jew may be asked to give up his life, that which is so precious to us, and therefore the most difficult to give up. People give up money all the time. For some, it is difficult to give up money too. But money, depending on the amount that may be asked, we give for all kinds of causes. But to give one's self, one's spirit, to sacrifice oneself for Hashem, that is very, very difficult. It's a tremendous challenge and test. But David Amelech says that he's prepared to do that when necessary. Why say that? What's the significance of saying these words? Ultimately, the real test will come when one has to prove it. You are sincere, prove it. Prove it with deeds, with ma'asim. This is important, as Azor explains, because to verbalize what we're ready to do, what we think about, is also significant. As the Kabbalah teaches, as the Kabbalah teaches, there is a need to sometimes express ourselves by machshava, at other times by dibur, and at other times by ma'aseh. There was machshava with our thought, dibu with our speech, and ma'aseh with deed. Here he's saying that he's expressing himself with dibu, verbalizing his thoughts. And the Zohar says to verbalize those pure thoughts, those important thoughts are necessary from time to time. This prayer, as I said earlier, is said as part of the Tahanun prayer every morning. Tachanun is at a very important spot in the prayer. It is said right after the Amidah. The Amidah, that long prayer that we say standing up, contains with it many personal requests. We praise Hashem, we thank Hashem, but we also make various kinds of requests in all areas of life. So after we've thought about ourselves, after we've asked for ourselves and for our families and for anyone who may have some need that we had them in mind, we immediately sit down and some have the custom of putting their head down and say the Tachanun in a form of gesture that we are willing to give up our life if necessary to atone for our sins, to sanctify God's name because we realize that we've made all these requests for ourselves and perhaps we don't deserve them. Perhaps there are many, many sins out there on our record that prevent us from, from being eligible for any of those benefits that we're asking for. So we make that gesture of tachanun, which is a very, very much more serious and more powerful gesture than just the slach lam avino that we, that we said in the prayer. We did say slach we said we asked Hashem for forgiveness. But here the tachanun is much more concentrated, much more focused, especially with the willingness of Mesirut nefesh this particular mizmor, this chapter, if you look at it closely, you will see that it's composed according to the Aleph bit. Look at every one of the Pesukim after Le David, and you will see Aleph, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zayn. Well, you won't see Vav actually, and you won't see Bet, and you won't see Resh. The last Pesuk, Pei, 
is a letter that repeats itself. So pay is mentioned twice. So is resh. Resh appears twice. What you don't find is bet and kuf. So bet is not here. Kuf is not here. Vav is not here. Resh is mentioned twice, and so is pay, pay being the last letter. So, what's going on over here? Well, the fact that the Mizmor is organized in such a way according to the alphabet is significant, and we see that more than once. So apparently there's something to it. The alphabet has tremendous koach, has tremendous power. The world was created with the 22 letters of the Aleph Bet, as the Sefer Yitzira teaches. So there's definitely something behind Aleph Bet. But it's all al-pisod, it's all Kabbalistic, and we're not really going to get into it too much, except that it is mentioned that the Vav represents the tree of life. And since this prayer has more to do with Misirut HaNefesh, giving up life, it is not befitting to mention Vav the letter Vav over here. It is not compatible, I should say. Whereas Bet and Kuf are not mentioned because Bet and Kuf represent <coughs> the external forces, the impure forces, the forces that are opposed to us doing the will of Hashem. And because these letters have some association with, with them, we don't want to mention them over here. We don't want them to have any power to get, receive any power as a result of including them in this very important prayer. So that's what Bet and Kuf are left out. Resh, for some reason, is mentioned twice, and so is Pei, but these are, this is all according to the Kabbalah. He goes on to say, Elohai b'cha batachti alevosha al yaltsu oivayli. My God, I trust in you. Don't don't make it happen that I should be, God forbid, embarrassed as a result of that trust in you. Ali al Ali, and don't let it happen that my enemies should rejoice in, have, in the fact that I have trusted you and, and somehow nothing happened. What happened to all that trust, they may say. So therefore, don't uh, make me fail in any way where they will where the enemies will realize that all that I have done and my faith was in vain, God forbid. After all, I did trust in you, so whatever I asked of you, please, you know, grant it to me. Here, the emphasis is clear on midat habitachon. He says the words batahti. And this, from time to time, one can see that it's, it's a very significant midah, as opposed to just plain emunah. People understand what emunah is, to believe, to have faith in God, but to trust in Him and to rely on Him is a whole different idea. And according to the Kabbalah, whoever has pure trust, real trust in God, nothing can harm Him. So the bitachon in itself in Hashem is a tremendous segula, tremendous segula of protection from harm. He completely trusts, but it has to be pure, it has to be complete. And it has to be, of course, something that is normal. The person says, I have complete trust that I will win the lottery. Who says God wants you to win the lottery? Hmm. What kind of trust is that? We're not talking about that kind of trust. Because we don't know what Hashem wants for us. But trust meaning that whatever is meant to happen is going to happen. Everything is for the good. Whatever Hashem wants for me to have, that's what I will have. Wherever I'm meant to go, that's where I will go. And I trust that He guides me. As long as, of course, I conduct myself properly and I do the right thing, there's no reason for me to be misguided. Hashem leads the way. So bitachon is a very, very special kesha, a very special connection and relationship between the human being and God. And not everyone has this on a very high level. People worry, people have all kinds of concerns that are, are unfounded. They shouldn't be concerned about that. If they really understood the ways of Hashem, which is what part of this chapter deals with, the ways of God. The Vila says, I don't 
necessarily understand everything, but I have bitachon in Hashem. So Alevosha, he says, don't let me be embarrassed on the country. I want your name to be sanctified. I want him to see that all along I was right in trusting you. Don't let them make fun of me. Besides myself, Gam kol lo yevoshu, yevosho bogedim rekam. Don't let those who look forward to you, kol kovecha, those who have their hopes in you, those who yearn for you, don't allow them to either be embarrassed. If anybody should be embarrassed, it's the traitors. What do the traitors do? Habogedim rekam. They betray the poor people, especially, as Rashi says, the commentary, by stealing from the poor and by emptying them, emptying their pockets. That's why the word rekam is said here, as opposed to chinam. Even though chinam and rekam here pretty much are the same, chinam means for no real reason. They shouldn't really be doing it. They still do it. Here, the commentary, Rashi says that it's talking about treacherous people who commit an act of treason, and I'll explain why, by going after the poor and by taking advantage of them. They should be the ones to be embarrassed, if anybody. So this requires a little bit of uh, an explanation. The first part, when he says, Gam kol lo yevoshu, those who look up to you, those who trust in you, who yearn for you, don't let them either be embarrassed. What he's saying is that he as king has many people relying on him. And him, and he, the king, relies on God. So he says, don't forget about them either. They are relying on me. In other words, it's not just for me. I have so many people relying on me. It's a very important idea over here for two reasons. Reason number one, sometimes Hashem lets a person continue whatever it is that he's doing, uh, keeps him alive, because so many people rely on him or need him. Not that he necessarily needs to be around, not that necessarily that he needs to be doing whatever he is doing. Hashem somehow enables him to continue to succeed or to stay alive only because so many depend on him. So here David Melech is using that, so many people, so many people depend on him, and he <coughs> depends on God. So therefore, don't abandon them. Don't let them down. <clears throat> Another idea behind this statement is that it's a very good idea for every, anyone who prays to always include himself in the many, in the tzibur. person has a certain need. He should include himself in the prayer of all the other people who, need, who have the same need. Somebody that is sick we include them with the rest of the people who are sick. So in this way, there's a koach to the tzibur. There's a special power that the many have as opposed to the individual. Imagine, it's, it's, it's a totally different idea, but imagine you want to communicate with someone about something that you're not happy that he did. And you, you're about to point to a flaw that he, that he may have. How do, you, how do you make sure that what you tell him is effective and that he doesn't get it the wrong way? That he doesn't feel insulted about it? What's the most effective way? The rabbis advise us that instead of telling somebody, you will have this problem, say, we have this problem. Never say you, say we. You know, we, t we human beings, tend to have certain flaws. You're not pointing at him. He himself hopefully will understand from that that he's one of them, but so am I. We all have this weakness. So what are we gonna, what are we gonna do about it? See what I mean? So that, that's just a more a psychological approach to certain situations that are very delicate. But I, I, I like that example because it pretty much accomplishes the same thing by including ourselves with the individual, we have a better chance of being effective. So here, by including ourselves or our requests with the prayers of others in the eyes of Hashem, this may be more powerful. 
So he mentions Gam Kol Koyvecha, even all those people out there who also trust in you. Don't forget about them. So let's go back to the Bogdim now, the treacherous people. Boged means to betray. Bgida means treason. Why are these people being called Bogdim? What's, what does Bogdim have to do with this? Call them Reshaim, call them wicked, call them Evilim, right? evil people. There's many, many words to describe people who are no good. And David Melech has used many, many words. He has a whole list of descriptions of people who are Beliyal, Raim, lot of him, right? People who are no good, people who are wicked and evil and, and so forth. Why he Bogdim? So besides Rashi's commentaries that it's talking about those who somehow uh, cheat the poor, I think there's a lot more to what he's saying. This is a follow-up, remember, of what he said in the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, he extolled the individual who's the kikapayim, an individual who is clean, who has clean hands. Right? Remember, in his business dealings, he's honest, he doesn't cheat, he doesn't steal. This is an individual that will succeed Bezat Hashem of La'alot El Har Hashem, of climbing, of ascending the mountain of God, of being able to grow spiritually. In this is an important way, by possessing this important quality of being clean from cheating and stealing. That in itself is a tremendous big accomplishment. If a person is clean in that area of money, he doesn't take people's money, he doesn't think of ever stealing their money, borrowing without permission, all of that is stealing. If a person is clean in his hands, that's a tremendous characteristic that enables him to grow and get closer to Hashem, which is what David Amalek was describing in ascending the mountain of God. So here he's talking about the opposite midah of those individuals who are clean. What's the opposite? One who does steal, one who does cheat. Right? One who's not clean. And he calls him a boged. Okay. We understand that this midah is the opposite because Rashi says that they are stealing from the poor. But why call him a boged? Why treason? Call him a ganav, a thief. What's boged have to do with it? No, I didn't see anybody talk about it, but it came to me something very, very interesting. I think it's fascinating. We once gave a lecture about the alphabet, for those of you who remember the meaning of each letter of the alphabet, the shape of why it looks the way it looks. Some letters, like the mem, consists of two letters, a kaf and a vav. The Kabbalistic meaning behind them, how words are, are uh, built or formed, I should say, in the various letters. And when you see three-letter root or stem of a word, you can pretty much figure out what that word is, even if you've never learned Hebrew, Lashon HaKodesh, by analyzing the position of each letter. Once you know the function of each letter, what does the Lamed do? What is the operation of a Lamed do when you see a Lamed in a word? What does a Pei do? Right? What does a Mem do? Once we become familiar with what each letter represents and what it does in a word, its function, when you, put the, when you see the letters together, you will say, oh, I know what this is all about. This is a cat. This is describing the cat. Because you see the letters, het, taf, and lamin. And I'm not going to go into that right now. Why? But this is an example, right? Peel, an elephant. Why is it called a peel? Because it has a pay in the lamin. And because of what these letters represent, we can understand that it's describing an elephant. Right? And the same is with every word. Shemesh, the sun. Why is Shemesh called Shemesh? So there must be some reason. And look at the letters that make up Shemesh, and you may be able to figure it out. All right. Rabbis tell us that Gimel and Dalad, besides, for, let's forget for a moment what they mean, the fact that they're close to each other is significant. Why? Gimel represents Gomel, he who does something good. And Dalet represents the poor man. Dalim. Gomel, Dalim. 
So the gimel, which looks like a man walking, and by the way, gimel does have something to do with nu'ah, with movement, is right before the dalet, which represents, among other things, a poor man. A poor man is, one of the words for poor man is dal. There's ani, there's avion, there's rash, and there's dal. Each one of those synonyms represents a different degree, perhaps, of poverty. But a dal is really somebody who has not uh, has not a lot of money, or who may have had, but has lost a lot of money. Either way, he's a very poor, needy person. So the gimel is close to the dalit because the job of the gimel is to help the dalit. Gimel gomel to do, to contribute, to grant, to who? To the dal, to the poor man. Okay. Very nice that they're together. But the same word for gomel, which starts with a gimel, is also gozel. Steel. To steal. Interesting, no? Mm-hmm. The same letter for gomel is gozel. So you have a possibility or the potential for somebody being nice to the dal, gomel, like gomel chasadim, to be kind, to do something for the poor man. Or you can do the opposite, the exact opposite. You can be gozel, you can steal, rob the poor man. So what is happening when somebody robs instead of helping? Who boged, he is betraying the original, the original job, the original thing that he's supposed to do. He's doing the opposite of what he's meant to do. You're meant to help and instead steal. You see, it's the exact opposite. You know, there are people who don't do anything. They don't help. Okay, but to steal is the exact opposite of helping. Comes along the word boged and tells us that that's exactly what's happening. Boged has the letters Gimel and Dalet in it. You see the word boged? Bet, which serves another function of being the first letter of the verb. But within the, after the bet, the, st- the main structure of this word is a gimel and dalet too. In other words, in this word boged, which by the way, beged, a garment also contains those three letters, just different vowels, you see the gimel and dalet together. So the, why is it called treason? Or why is this man called a, tr- uh, a treacherous man, an act of treason? Because of the gimel and the dalet. That he's switching around the act of what's supposed to be a good act, and he's, make, he, he's making it a bad act. So this is just my explanation, of, which I thought was very interesting, of why perhaps he's calling these individuals Bogdim. Because they're doing the opposite of what they're supposed to be doing. Instead of helping, instead of being clean, they have filthy hands. They've robbed from the poor, not just from the rich, from the poor. The simple idea behind the word boged over here is, of course, a dishonest person. And because we're talking about a dishonest person, it is coming to him that he should be Yevoshu. He should be embarrassed. That his sins should come out in the open and become public. All right. Let's ask another question. Why would somebody be a boged? Why would somebody stoop to that level and steal from the poor? Or still, in general, why would somebody do that? Only because he does not have what David Melech has. David Melech says, Elokai becha I trust in you. Don't, don't embarrass me. If anybody should be embarrassed, he says, Bogdim, who don't have bitachon. An individual who is capable of stealing and stealing from the poor is because he has no trust in God, who provides for everyone, who takes care of the livelihood of everyone. And the same God who also knows our thoughts. Aren't you afraid of him? That he knows your thoughts, he knows exactly what you're thinking. And don't you have any trust that he will provide for you, that you have to stoop to that level and steal? So it's all a lack of bitachon. You see how the lack of bitachon and trust in Hashem causes people to make many mistakes, causes them to be misguided. Besides their worries and concerns, their attitude is so different of an individual who has bitachon Hashem. He's much more confident. He's much more relaxed. He's calm. He does his best, of course, 
to, to make himself comfortable and to live his life as best as possible, of course, according to his means and so forth. But there are many, many things that are beyond our control. So who controls them? Hashem does. Things don't happen random according to the, what we believe. It's all behash gacha. It's all through direct divine providence and, and, and supervision. But it takes bitachon to understand that at all times, not just once a year. We hear it and we say, yes, it's true. No, no, it's to live it. And we have every single day, almost, opportunities uh, that test our bitachon. Do you really trust or not? A boged is, is doing what he's doing because he doesn't have bitachon. So look at to what level he had to stoop. Next pasuk. Hashem, please show me your ways and teach me your paths. You see here, there's two words for ways. Derachecha, which is basically way, road, derech, and the word orchotecha, which has to do with paths. What's the difference between a way and a path? Anybody want to recommend something? What, why should David Amela say derachecha and then orchotecha? He's defining different types of ways. Even though ways are ways, but they're not, they're not all made the same. There is a freeway and there's a street. A freeway is much more visible because it's so wide. There are paths and trails that are not so apparent because they're not as wide and not so visible. So orchotecha are called, in English, the best translation is paths, because they're a little bit more concealed than derachecha. So in asking Hashem hodieni, isn't he asking for something very familiar? It's what Moshe asked, exactly the same thing. Hodieni at na derachecha, please. Show me, teach me your ways. What ways? I want to understand why or how you deal with the wicked, with Rashaim. How come you give them a lease of life for 25 years if they're, if they're wicked? Why don't you just get rid of them? I'd like to know how you deal, especially with the wicked. So, the Rachech Hashem Odi'eni, in general, means that David Melech wants to have an understanding of why Hashem does certain things that really are, are, are puzzling, that things that we see, like derachecha, we see it. Whereas orchotecha is, I'd also like you to teach me, lamedeni, about those things that are more concealed. What could be more concealed? It could be halachot of how to deal in situations that are lifnim meshurat adin, the commentaries tell us. Lifnim meshurat adin means, how do I conduct myself? Or teach me how I should deal with certain situations, not by the letter of the law, but beyond the letter of the law. In other words, how to deal with certain situations that are very tricky, where one has to forget it for a moment what the regular halakha is and how to deal with it in a creative way. Remember Shalom Melech with the story with the two women? It's my baby. No, it's my baby. That required tremendous chokhmah, wisdom, right? Hashem gave him wisdom of what to say, what to suggest. That's something similar. Teach me or chotecha. Path, that which is more concealed in all kinds of complex situations, how to deal with them. Some say Lamedeni does not only mean to teach me, train me, in other words, make it so that I, I should become accustomed to it, that it should be second nature to me, that I should be able to follow these paths. So the request here really is not only to be taught, but because he uses the word, I'm sorry, in the first pasuk, he asks to be taught and to know, whereas in the next pasuk, it's more guidance. Okay, that's going to be the difference, as we see. Right now, it is to be taught, teach me, 
make me understand why certain things happen the way they do. And in the next pasuk, he says, Hadricheni. You see the word, you see the difference? First it's Hodi'eni and Lamedeni, which has to do with knowledge, with letting him know. I'd like to become familiar with your ways. I'd like to understand why certain things happen. And by the way, if somebody wants to learn, there's a lot of, there's a lot of what to learn. In other words, when David Melech, of course, is asking Hashem to show him, it's through Ruach HaKodesh as well. It's the many, many things that are not so accessible. It's the deeper secrets of, of why Hashem does certain things. Otherwise, <coughs> open up a book. Open up the Torah. But even if you learn the Torah, not everything is apparent. There's a lot of orchotecha. There's a lot of situations that require special help from Hashem. So David Amelech is asking in Pasuk Dalet for help in understanding Hashem's ways in this world. And in Pasuk Hey, he says, Hadricheni ba'amitecha, which has to do with guidance. What kind of guidance? Hadricheni ba'amitecha, please guide me in your righteousness, in your truthness, in your truthfulness, which is, a, which is a special request that he should not stumble. People make mistakes. We're only human. It's only human to err, to make a mistake. But it's not nice to make mistakes. We don't want to make a mistake. So there's special protection accorded to certain individuals, to the tzaddikim, to those who are righteous, that Hashem will not allow them to make a mistake, to stumble and say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. They're always so careful. When a mistake does happen, we don't know why the mistake happened, unless, unless of course, we're negligent. But some mistakes, it's beyond us, which David Amela talks about too later on. Shegiot mi yavin ministarot nakeni. I have no clue, no idea why certain mistakes happen. But he's asking, he's praying, and this is a very special prayer that everybody should say, and we do say it somewhat in the morning, that we should not stumble, we should not make a mistake. There, there is a prayer like that. So, Hadricheni ba mitecha, guide me in your truthfulness, in your righteousness, that I should not stumble, that I should go on the right path, the path that you want me to go, and I should not lose my way or, God forbid, be misguided. Vilamedeni kiata elohe yishi otcha kiviti kolayom. And teach me that I should become used to knowing things on my own. First you have to teach me, first you have to show me. You are the God who has saved me. And therefore, kiviti, otcha kiviti kolayom, therefore in you I, I look to all day long. What is he adding over here by saying kiata yishi? What does helping or saving have to do with teaching and learning? But since we're talking about a very special request of not making a mistake in learning, not just a mistake in life, not only a mistake in the battlefield, but in learning, we're talking about a very special area that's called in Hebrew, in Aramaic, siata dishmaya, divine assistance, lechaven halacha lemaase, so that we should be able to figure out the halacha in practice. In other words, in trying to figure out what the halacha is, what the ruling is, in a particular complex situation which we don't know, not everything is black and white. You have, some, you have an animal. Is it taref or kasher? Sometimes it's difficult to figure it out. There are many, many complex issues in halacha too. So the Vida asks, I want you to help me as you have helped me in other areas that I should not make a mistake and I should be able to also be f figure out the halakha, what the halakha is in this particular area. Now we have a tradition that who merits such protection? One who learns Torah Lishma. As we will be learning in Pirkei Avot, when we read it during this time of the year. A person who learns Torah Lishma, learns Torah for its real sake, not for its own benefit, not for honors, not for reward. He will merit receiving many, many benefits. 
tremendous benefits that the individual gains himself by learning Torah Lishma, plus what they grant him from above. Torah Lishma is a very high level, which not too many people do. Torah Lishma, learning Torah for its real sake, requires not only tremendous immersion and dedication, it, remind, it requires a certain state of mind, a pure state of mind, proper focus, and, and, and the right attitude. In other words, it's, it's, it's not just to learn or to study a book like most people just do, study to get the knowledge. It's not just about the knowledge. It, it's a whole different kind of an experience. And there were people who learned Torah Lishma Big Sadiqim, and as a result of their Torah Lishma, they merited that their commentaries became renowned all over the world. Jews are learning their commentaries. Why only certain commentaries have that merit? You know how many great rabbis wrote commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch? Not all of them merited that they should be placed and published together with the Shulchan Aruch. Why this one yes and this one not? You have to know the, their, their story. You have to know who they were and you will understand that they deserve it. That their Torah is pure. Not that everybody else's Torah is not pure, but this was a very high level of Torah called Torah Lishma. So when a person is able to learn Torah for its real sake, he merits many, many things. So he's asking for help. He's asking for help, for that kind of help, for Siyatad Lishmaya, that he should be able to learn properly and that he should be able to arrive at the right conclusion when it comes to Allah especially a complex halacha. Why does he say, Kiviti kol hayom? I yearn for you, or I look to you, or hope in you an entire day. So the commentaries tell us that this kol hayom is referring to, to the nations of the world who are represented with by day, whereas Am Yisrael, through, throughout this olam hazeh, throughout this physical world, we are in Laila, at night. When Mashiach comes, it will be for us day. So this world, this transitory world, is for us compared to night, and that is why the day follows the night. Olam Abba follows Olam Azeh. Galut is also compared to night. And what do you think happened? The majority of, the, of our existence has been in Galut. <laughs> right? If you compare the, the amount of years that we've been in Israel, <coughs> the amount of years that we're outside of Israel, we're more outside than inside. So therefore, in describing the Jewish nation, there's sometimes a, a description of night, whereas the nations of the world are described as day. So, kiviti kol hayom, in this context, it could be, as the commenters explain, referring to that David Amelech is asking for this special help during Olam Azeh, during the physical existence that we have that we need extra help. It could be that the reason why he says Kola Yom too is because as a result of the Yom, as a result of the non-Jews, as a result of the, the pressures that we have from the outside world, it is difficult. People who, who are under stress cannot learn as well. So because of all the pressures of Hayom, David Melech is asking for extra help. Next pasuk. Zechor rachamecha Adonai v'chasadecha ki me'olam hema. Remember your compassion, Hashem, and your kindness ki me'olam hema. They've been around forever. All right. What now? David Amelech right now is asking Hashem that his sins, whatever they may be from the past, should not hamper in any way or get in the way of him being able to succeed in his learning and his getting closer to Hashem. As we will see in the next pasuk, he be, he, in the next pasuk he's a little bit more specific about that. Here he doesn't, he's not so specific about the, and therefore you don't see the word sins. All he asks is Hashem, please remember your compassion. Why does he have to remember compassion, obviously? Who do you ask for compassion from? if you feel that maybe you don't deserve it. So David Amela says, you know, maybe I don't deserve all that help. But Hashem, you have Midat Rachamim, you have Chesed. And these two 
midot, these two characteristics of compassion and kindness, they go back, way back. Ki me'olam hema. They're from the very beginning they've been around. From when? From the time you created the world. Remember, you couldn't just create a world with the attribute of justice. People, it wouldn't last. People wouldn't live. You know, every mistake, you're gone. So what do we have today? People make mistakes. People commit a sin or a transgression, right? And Hashem says, you know what? I give you a second chance. You can do Teshuvah. You can repent. That's because of Rachamecha, Vachasadecha. Hashem combined Midat HaRachamin to Midat din to enable people to fix their mistakes. So therefore, Hashem, remember through your Rachamim and your Hasadim, remember those Midot, meaning if necessary, please bring them up so that my sins, which may be there still from the past, do not stand in the way. According to the Kabbalah, David HaMelech here, he is, is asking for Zechut Avot, for the merit of his forefathers. Rachamecha is Yaakov, Chasadecha is Abraham. Abraham is known for the chesed, for the kindness, and Rachamim is relating to Yaakov. So where is Yitzchak? If we have Rachamecha, Yaakov, and Chasadecha, Abraham, where is Yitzchak? So the Kabbalah says that Yitzchak is reserved for the Atid level for the future, because he takes revenge from all the goyim who have caused many, many tsarot, much injustice and pain and suffering to the Jewish people. He is din. He represents justice. Justice, leave it for Lati Lavo for the future, right before Mashiach comes. That's when Yitzchak's midah comes in. Until then, we, we want to have the rachamim and the, hasadot, and the hasadim. Next pasuk, now he becomes more specific. So what I'm asking you, I ask you for the Rachamim, because I don't want you to bring up my sins from when? From the Uray, from my youth. Ufeshai, my transgressions. Ufeshai is things that are done more negligently or intentionally. Whereas chata'ot are more unintentional. Regardless, it's on the record. So whether sins or, or more serious transgressions, they are from the past altiskor. Please don't bring them up. Don't let them stand in the way. Deal with me with your kindness. What does that mean? To deal with me with your kindness means since you have that midah of chesed, point to those good deeds that I have, to the kind deeds that I have. You know, you have chesed. So look for the kind deeds and remember those that I have done. Don't focus on the bad. Don't focus on the transgressions. Focus on the good things. Now, when one reads this, he may say, well, that's obvious. <laughs> Don't look at that, look at the, the good. But the point is, he's asking. Forget about what's obvious. Of course it's obvious. But the point here is that David Melech is, is teaching us that this is exactly what prayer is all about. This is the way it's done. It, it, we say, but it's obvious. Can't Hashem just look at this? I mean, why, why would he look? Would he really look at that too? I mean, what, what, would my prayer request make a difference? The answer is yes. Because if we don't pray, there may be a categoria, there may be some accusation that I say, no, well, wait a minute, look at that. You know, there's a record out there. So David Amir says, through your midata rachamim, I implore you, don't look at that, look at only the good. Who are you to ask me something like that? Who are you to tell me what to, to look at? Obviously, it helps. That's what prayer is all about. That's the power of prayer. That we say, we say, please ignore that. Don't let the prosecution present this evidence. Objection, Your Honor. Right? You like that one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and Hashem says, He's right. <laughs> What's the word for it? Objection? Sustained. Sustained. <laughs> yes, it helps. At least for David Melech, it does. 
we hope for us too. So please bring up and remember the good things I've done, as your chesed is, your midah. But then he says, life for your sake, for the sake of your goodness. Tuvcha? He just said, you just said, kechazdecha. What's tuvcha have to do with it? Okay, so before we get to that, let's analyze a little bit what he's asked over here. He's asked for Hashem to overlook his sins. This is very, very significant. We said it's a prayer, but it's more than a prayer. It's called a confession. It's called a vidui. And one of the conditions for proper teshuvah is to confess, to verbalize our confession to Hashem. I'm sorry. I don't want to do it. Or I don't want to do it again. I feel terrible about it. That's vidui. And vidui confession is a way of preparing for teshuvah. When one does want to do proper teshuvah, he specifies quietly between him and Hashem, only not for everybody to hear. We're talking about sins between him and Hashem. Nobody should hear them. But to Hashem, he specifies this, 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 that. That's part of Teshuvah. And that's exactly what he's doing now. He's being more specific. He says, if I have, then I'm, I'm being specific about those things that I feel bad about. In different words, that's what he's saying too. So this is an important condition in doing proper Teshuvah is to be specific and to mention those transgressions from the past and to ask forgiveness for them. All right. So, but at the end he says, and I'm asking all of you all this because leman tu vecha, because of your goodness, for the sake of your goodness, Hashem. This last words is a special emphasis because rabbis tell us midat tova meruba midat poranut. Even though there is an attribute of justice, even though there can be punishment, and they all as a, act as atonements, the midah of tov, midat chesed, or goodness or kindness, is many many times greater, more powerful than midat poranut, than judgment, than strict judgment. So much so that the rabbis tells us, even if a person had a good thought and he just couldn't carry out, he didn't succeed, he didn't manage, something happened, it stopped him, but he had a good thought. That good thought is counted somewhat. And it was eventually Hashem adds it with other deeds that he has performed. So that means it counts. A good thought counts, and a bad thought doesn't? Yes, that's exactly so. Usually, most of the time, bad thoughts don't count as an act. They're bad. They're terrible. A person's mind should not be contaminated with bad thoughts. They, they can really influence him very, very negatively and harm him. But it's not a deed. He, he just thought about it. He didn't do it. A good thought does count. So he says, Leman tuvecha Hashem. For the sake of your goodness, Hashem, your goodness is so much more than the Midat Adin and the attribute of justice. So therefore, count everything. Look at all that I have done, all that I have thought of doing, perhaps. Consider all of that. Next pasuk. Tov ve'yashar Adonai al ken yorech ha'taim badarech. Hashem is good and straight. Therefore, al Ken, he will guide the sinners in his way, in the right way. Simply stated, Hashem shows the way, the proper way, to, to sinners. He wants to straighten them out. He calls upon them to do Teshuvah. And this can happen in all kinds of ways. Why is he called Yashar? Because Hashem is straight. Hashem wants things to be straight. And if something is not straight, He wants to straighten it out. That's the whole idea behind enabling people to correct their mistakes, to do Teshuvah. So to bring them back, the baderech, to bring them back in the right path, that's why He's called Yashar. And this can happen in all kinds of ways where Hashem awakens the person, the Teshuvah. And I'm going to share with you just one story, one of my favorite, as an example of how an individual woke up. This story happened perhaps 100 years ago, give or take. 
There was a young man in one of the yeshivot in Eastern Europe who was becoming bored, uninterested in continuing to learn, and he was more eager to get out to the outside world, business world, and do something. So he left the yeshiva. Well, you know, people go to work, there's nothing wrong with that. People go out and do all kinds of things. The problem is, as a result of him leaving the yeshiva, he no longer was surrounded with, with good boys, and he was exposed to bad elements out there, in the, in the big world. And as a result of being exposed to those elements, his spirituality suffered. And he deteriorated day after day. He stopped keeping kosher, then he stopped keeping Shabbat, then he stopped putting on tzolin. I mean, little by little, he stopped doing everything. His parents at the time, this was happening in the very beginning, tried to dissuade him from going, but it, it didn't help. They eventually passed away. And after they passed away, you can imagine, there's no, there are no parents, there's no backbone, there's no support, so he, things got even worse with him. He completely left the community and was totally not observant in any way. All right, one day, He's sitting, eating lunch. And as he's eating his sandwich, he notices that a book falls off one of the shelves. He had a bookshelf of all the books that he was no longer reading, <laughs> learning. So he noticed a book fell off the shelf. So he went to pick it up and figured, okay, book fell, fell. So let me put it back on the shelf. He goes back to finish his lunch. He hears a, no a knock. The same book apparently fell again. Okay. So he figures, well, maybe there's not enough room. Let me move some books around. And he pushed it further in so it shouldn't fall. Goes back to sit down. Two minutes later, the book falls down again. He says, this is very, very strange. He picks up the book to, to see what book is this. And he sees it's, it's Sha'are Teshuvah, which is a very famous book about uh, the gates of repentance, right? That's what it's called. And it's about repentance. It's about guiding people how to repent. And as soon as he saw the title of that book, he began to cry. He realized at that moment how far he has deviated from the, from the path that he was originally, how far he has strayed. That's the word I was looking for. And from that moment on, he decided to return and to do teshuva. And the question is, what happened here? Why did they, from Shemaim, from heaven, make this happen to him, this book happen to him? Well, it turns out, I think if I recall correctly, or more likely than not, that his parents were righteous. The mother possibly cried for her son, prayed for her son, before she lit the candles every Shabbat, that her son should be a righteous young man, a good man, Right, And uh, because of all her tears, even though she passed away, those tears did not go to waste. They go up before Kisak Avod, before the throne of Hashem, and beg him to please help her son. It's not fair for a couple, husband and wife, who gave of themselves to Torah all their life, that this child of theirs, perhaps the only child, should go off the derech, off the path. And Midat HaRachamim obviously heard those cries, and saw those tears, and decided to give him a chance, just a chance. They don't push. They give him a chance. And they know what's going to wake him up, possibly. Right? They didn't send somebody to tell him off. They sent the book. <laughs> fall, fall. And when he saw that, obviously, it's not just a book falling. It's the same book falling three times, and it's... Of all books, it's Sharet Teshuvah, and in such an unusual way, it's obviously Mishamayim. So he was a little bit sensitive. He, he was, after all, a little knowledgeable that these things don't happen by chance. And that's what did it. So here we have the Zechut Avod, apparently. Apparently, perhaps the merit of the parent, or the parents, or sometimes the grandparent, that brought about this miracle, this reminder, this push, and it helped.
Yadrech Hanavim, this is the last pasuk we'll do for today. Yadrech Hanavim ba mishpat vilamed Hanavim darko. So we're talking about guiding the sinners, that Hashem guides the sinners in the proper path. Pasuk Tet is similar, but here he uses the word the humble. The first pasuk it says yore, he teaches them, he shows them. And we said that that showing can happen in all kinds of ways. The idea is to awaken them. But in Pasuk Tet he says yadrech, he guides them. What does it mean to guide them? Yadrech anavim ba mishpat, he guides the humble ba mishpat, through mishpat, through righteousness. Vilamed anavim darko, and he teaches the humble his way. So in general, this means to guide, to teach, to show the way. It's all the same, but it's a lot more than that. The rabbis tell us, I think in the Zohar, in the Midrash, that this pasuk is said in connection with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was taught the halachot of Arei Miklat. What happens to an individual who killed somebody unintentionally, set up cities of refuge, right? Arei Miklat, so that he can be there until the death of the high priest of the Kohen Gadol. That's his penalty. That can be a, a term of 20, 30 years, or it could be less, depending on when the Kohen Gadol died. But anyway, that's part of his atonement. He killed unintentionally, right? And as a result of that, he has to be in Arem Iklat. Otherwise, if a relative finds him and kills him, he's not guilty of the death penalty. In other words, he deserves to be in Arem Iklat. Okay. So from the time Betin says you go to Anir Miklat until he reaches the Anir Miklat, could take a few days. And anything can happen in the meantime. So he better get to that city of refuge quickly. Because being in the city of refuge will offer him protection from any relative who's, who's upset at him. All right. How is he supposed to get there? How does he know where to go? So Moshe Rabbeinu was told, was instructed, when you set up the Anir Miklat, set up signs. Right? Take the 101, right? And get off at this exit. Five miles, right? Put up clear signs so that people should be able to go there quickly. So the rabbis explain, look what happens to a murderer. He murdered unintentionally. He is shown the way. They have signs for him how to get to the city of refuge, the more so to those who want to do teshuvah, to those who want to repent. The good people who made mistakes in their life, you don't think Hashem will show them the way? I think this is a beautiful idea here. Beautiful. He will show the humble. Why humble? Those who sincerely seek to do Teshuvah. See, they're sincere. They're called humble. They realize their mistake. They're asking Hashem for help. So Hashem will show them a mishpat through His righteousness. In other words, through the correct way of doing things, because that's the correct way of coming back, of fixing your mistakes. He will show them the right thing to do, the right place to go. And he will teach them that call his ways, that they should return and let go of their bad ways. So, on the one hand, there are commentaries ask, you have a tov, Hashem is good, but then you have a yashar, which is straight and strict. They don't really go together. Tov is good, it's kind, easy. Yeshan is strict, right? As the word Bamishpat says. How do they go together? The answer is Mishpat means Teshuvah. When a person who does things now according to the Mishpat, which means that he's given a chance to repent, to correct his way, because that's what Mishpat demands of him, that's when Tov comes together with Yashar. Goodness of Hashem and Yashar being straight with Hashem comes together in Mishpat. In other words, that he's doing things now the correct way, according to what they're supposed to be. If he does so, Yilamed Anavim Darko, then Hashem, of course, will guide him and will help him. This last statement, which says that Hashem will teach the, the sinners his way, or the humble his way, means what the rabbis tell us. That Kola Bali Taher. Those who truly seek divine assistance. Those who truly want to become pure and clean. Those who really want to do Teshuvah and return to Hashem. That's the word Litaher. 
whoever comes to become pure, he wants to do Tejumah, Mesayim lo minashamayim. He will receive divine assistance. You know, you know what divine assistance means? It will be in a miraculous way. I mean, it doesn't have to be. It could be in, a, it could be in all kinds of ways. But that's, from that story, you, you have proof in, a, in an incredible way. If somebody really wants it, Hashem will show him the way. That's all we have to do is ask and pray and say, Hashem, please help me. And those who want to sincerely, they will see that Hashem will come their way to help them. Amen. Amen. So,